Justice Dialogue, uh, uh, whatever the date is, 2012. Today's uh, the 7th of March. Justice Dialogue, 7th of March, 2012. My name is Michael Modern. I am a sustainer of the Working Families Party. I am uh, youth chairman of, of the Young Social Democrats, and I am with Occupy Buffalo. My good friend Heron, Mike, and Cindy. Okay. To understand the socialist movement, the democratic socialist movement, we can't listen to Rush Limbaugh and, and, and sort of marry it with Marxism and Leninism. That's different. That's two different internationals. We have the first international, which I forgot what year it was. Second international, which is the uh, international of democratic socialism, which still exists today. And then you got the third international, which Stalin created uh, to um, propel or to uh, favor Marxism, Leninism. So if any, if Rush Limbaugh or, or, or you ever get a chance to meet that, that what, are, what, what are internationals? Are they? The internationals are, are workers' movements, which which uh, were organized by socialists worldwide. That's what internationals are, the workers' movements. Organized by socialists worldwide, first, second, and third. And then as the revolutions, like the Cuban Revolution, or the Vietnamese, uh, uh, Vietnam War, the Chinese Revolution, uh, excel, that's when you, when you say uh, fourth international, fifth international. So it, it, it depends on which tradition uh, happened in a, in a specific country and that's where the difference comes in because not every international is the same. The Cuban experience was not the same as the Vietnamese experience and the uh, British or the German experience was definitely not the same as the Chinese experience, the Russian experience. So that's the difference between the second and the third international. So if any neocon ever says, well, you guys support Stalin, no, we didn't. They were expelled in 1919 when the SPA, Socialist Party of America, the party of Eugene Debs and Ernie Thomas, uh, uh, expelled the, the communist elements of the SPA for supporting the Soviet doctrine. So we, Heron and I were talking about this. The, um, what started with the, uh, oh, here, here's a copy of our timeline, and then, here we go, this our timeline. What started with the Working Man's Party in, in the 18, uh, I believe it was 1828, um, a, a group that supported, a group founded in Philadelphia that supported a limited work day. This is the Working Man's Party of 1820. This is this is before the Manif Communist Manifesto was written. The Communist Manifesto was written in 1842. Uh, 1848, um, it was supported a limited work day, public education, sound familiar? Uh, and uh, many of the activists were, 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 were uh, affiliated with trade unions, which was fairly new back then considering unions were, were, were few and far between because the work days were so harsh. Um, basically, it was started in, in the 1820s. Uh, sort of divided itself in 1919 and 1972 after a series of splits in the movement happened and then you had uh, not only a uh, difference of opinion but you had splinter groups like Socialist Labor Party or Party of Social Liberation which, which is very recent. The socialist experience in the United States is very unique because this, the, the, the longest lifespan in its history is with the Socialist Party of America, the party of Eugene Debs, Norman Thomas, Helen Keller, Mother Jones, A. Philip Randolph, Jack London, up to, not Upton Sinclair, I believe Upton Sinclair is a little, I don't think he was a, he was a uh, SPA member, Mother Jones and Michael Harrington. Um, you had a workers movement which has moved towards the center since the end of World War II. The Social Democratic Party of Germany, which my organization is called Social Democrats USA, which that's our sister party, uh, used to, in the in the 1800s was for the abolition of capitalism. I mean, let's let's get rid of it. Let's start new. This is before the Russian Revolution changed everything, and the Bolsheviks uh, put their perspective into the experience of socialism, where uh, the democratic socialists said, well, we're not for the abolition of capitalism anymore. Now we're more for a democratic workplace. So instead of overthrowing capitalism, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, Britain, and Israel said, well, let's, let's not overthrow capitalism. Let's, let's 
be in favor of a more democratic workplace, which uh, is a better alternative depending on which experience. Right. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off yeah, for a sentence, but I was wondering, um, the 1828 Working Men Party, mm -hmm. the 1876 Working Men's Party, both proud in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. were those all white men? Um, at the time, I believe it was. So when when does diversity start to appear in the social sector? Early 1900s. Okay. Early 1900s. Uh, that's a great question that that, that Harris asked because asked um, because um, the SPA, Socialist Party of America, the party of Debs and Thomas, can, did not boast a lot of African American members in the early days. Did not did not boast that. Uh, the majority of African Americans that were very proactive in politics, especially Marxism, joined not the SPA, but the CPUSA. That changed with a gentleman by the name of A. Philip Randolph, the pioneer of the Civil Rights Movement. A. Philip Randolph was noted in this book uh, for joining the Socialist Party of America, and even Baynard Rustin. But A. Phil let's start with A. Philip Randolph. This, this is how the Socialist Party becomes diverse. It becomes diverse primarily, or it, diverse, it diversifies itself primarily because A. Philip Randolph was a member, and uh, later on you had people like Helen Keller and Mother Jones, but A. Philip Randolph was anti-communist. So that's why he was a member, but he really um, was not the token African American, but the, uh, the pioneer of diversifying the SPA, which a lot of, uh, of which a lot of the unions were whites only. You know what I'm saying? So that changed with A. Philip Randolph when A. Philip Randolph took on the defense companies that the government had contracts with. He took on the Pullman Railway Company, which uh, did not have unionized employees, which was the uh, top. Uh, employer of African Americans next to barbers in, uh, in the early 1900s. So for African Americans to come up the way they did, we could thank A. Philip Randolph, a fellow uh, socialist uh, party member, uh, for doing that. For uh, Now, does that mean the Socialist Party was bad and that it was always uh, uh, anti-people of color or uh, pro-segregationist? No, it wasn't. Um, it's just, it changed with the IWW, which was a radical union uh, that Helen Keller was a member of, and I believe mm -hmm. Philip Randolph was a member of the IWW. Wobblies. So, yeah, Wobblies. So was Eugene Debs. That changed around the turn of the century because A. Philip Randolph uh, took on the, uh, the status quo. So, so to, to, to answer your question, yeah, in, in the 1800s, it was very common for the unions to be whites only, which a lot of their support came from was, was union, which later on turned into radical unions, and then the majority of African Americans uh, joined the CPUSA after, um, I believe this was in the 1950s. Because the CPUSA, the parties, did you ever hear of the People's League in World War So was there, yeah, was, it, was yeah. Was there a time before World War II when there was significant involvement in the Socialist Democratic Party of Blacks? Or it didn't really happen until the 50s or so? It didn't, it didn't really happen. Actually, Randolph, I believe, joined the Socialist Party in 1919. That's when Randolph joined the Socialist Party. That's what I thought. So you're saying from 1919 to the 1950s, there still weren't people of color in the party? Not many, no. No, because they were more uh, uh, they were more uh, inclined. Uh, the right word. I don't know what you're going to say. They were more inclined to join the CPUSA because the CPUSA was not only the party of uh, W. B. Du Bois, who was who was a radical uh, African American. The Communist Party. CPUSA was Communist Party. That didn't come until the 1950s when it established itself as uh, being a, a, a very well. It was Leninist. But it it it, uh, it was uh, it boasted a lot of minority members uh, because of the fact that um, the unions were in the early days were whites only, and then you had people like Jack London and Victor Berger who were racist. Moving on.
very much against blacks, George. No, uh, not, there was African Americans that joined. They, they weren't against African Americans joining. I'd say that the racism that came out of the SPA in the early days had something to do with the time period that they lived in. Uh, there was... Um, Socially discouraging and maybe, you know, as a matter of principle or something. Yeah, well, there was, excuse my language, Jack London once said, the only thing worse in the world is a horizontal and a GGDR. What he was referencing was his reference. Hey, how's it going? Hey. What he was referencing was he was referencing inter, uh, interracial marriages, and we all know how whites, or many whites, not all whites, but many whites felt about interracial marriages around the time of Jack London. So I guess that's they were against it. <laughs> yes. So that's why a lot of African Americans who were, who were radicalized and who wanted the right to vote. Uh, were uh, more inclined to join the CP as opposed to the SP, which um, Randolph pioneered when he uh, uh, organized the March on Washington in 1963. That was A. Philip Randolph. When Martin Luther King did his famous March on Washington, yeah. A. Philip Randolph was the chief organizer. Right. Bernard Rustin uh, sort of stayed behind. He was another African American uh, activist, a socialist activist stayed behind the scenes primarily because the FBI was threatening to out his, uh, his sexual orientation if he didn't stay behind the scenes and then Randolph sort of caught all, uh, or got all the credit for it later on uh, without the mainstream media uh, uh, talking about his party affiliation. So when the FBI, who was headed by Jake Hoover back then, threatened to out uh, Rustin's sexual orientation, that's when Rustin stayed behind the scenes and Randolph was the chief organizer. Randolph, when, when we say pioneer of the civil rights movement, it all was, it, it, it was, it was, it was, um, it was an evolution. Am I saying that right? Evolution? Yeah. Development. And when I say evol evolution is because first in 1919 he joined the Socialist Party after visiting Harlem. Randolph. Yes. Joined the Socialist Party after visiting Harlem and then um, he became active in the labor unions, taking on uh, uh, taking on the status quo in the labor unions that was very white's own. So when he took on the labor unions, he took on the union bosses, and they I believe they respected him for it because when he was 20, uh, the Attorney General of the United States called A. Philip Randolph the America's most dangerous Negro. When he was 20? When he was 20. America's most dangerous. <laughs> That's before he got into the quarter. The Pullman. Yeah, the Pullman. He, he was, he, he was uh, considered America's most dangerous Negro and then later on organized the Pullman <laughs> Railway Workers, which was a good job for African Americans at that time. Now, when I say good job, I'm not saying that being a porter is inferior or I'm saying that being a doctor is superior. Um, it's just the only people that were hiring. When Randolph uh, pioneered the Civil Rights Movement, the, the famous sign that people would carry around of all colors during the March on Washington was Jobs for All Now. That was Randolph. It was a march for jobs. It was a march for jobs. Because... 63. 63, yeah, it was a march for jobs, yeah. Because affirmative action had, had, had <laughs> come it. into fruition. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. So that was random right jobs for all now. Well, you know, you I, I was in New York City and there were free buses and I wanted to go to the, I mean, I wow. believed in the integration. Yeah. Yeah, I, I went with a friend. And no, it's not like the 63 March on yeah. Washington. Yeah. You yeah. saw Marlon King yeah. give his famous I Have a Dream speech? Uh, you can't really say that. I was in the crowd. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was an enormous crowd. It was crowd. the presence that mattered, though. Joan Baez sang, I couldn't hear that. I think Bob Dylan was there. A lot of people were there. I couldn't hear anything because I was, you know, I, I, I mean, believe, there were thousands and thousands uh, I, I of believe people. Uh, what's name uh, was also <laughs> there. Uh, Marlon Brando was also there? I just Probably. knew I was Probably. there. I mean, um, I was however. Great. It was great. No. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so, uh, it was really great. Do you know when Everybody smelled good. Philip Randolph started uh, organizing the Pullman car workers? I believe it was in the 1920s. Am I right? I was asking you. <laughs> so I believe it was in the 1920s. Um, what, I, what I can contribute in terms of Philip Hayfield Randolph is yeah. that I know yeah. 
that the organization of the Pullman Supporter was crucial for the Civil Rights Movement, not just for the March on Washington, yeah. but because of the fact that the Pullman Porters were all over the country. Yeah. And in specific states in the South, the prominence of their organization was a seed for the first civil rights actions. Yeah. So, like the boycott in um, Montgomery, the bus boycott, was largely organized by people who were connected with the Pullman Borders. Okay. And other activities that happened in Alabama were supported because they had a strong presence in Alabama. Exactly. So, you know, organization is extremely important. And, you know, A. Philip Randolph brought that organization to uh, the black community. And, yeah. and that structure was used by the movement in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we know he was the pioneer. Not to, not to discredit Martin Luther King. Randolph was a pioneer because when Martin Luther King, um, I believe, uh, spoke from the pulpit, Randolph was, uh, was in the mud. Now, Martin Luther King was in the mud too, but when I say Randolph was in the mud, I mean when he. Labor unions are strong today. Well, they're not as strong as they used to be, but um, when you're taking on union bosses that are in a whites only crowd, um, it shows a lot of bravery to, um, to uh, admit a guy like Randolph who, again, was considered, by the, by the time he was 20, was considered a, a, by Attorney General of the United States as America's most dangerous Negro, probably because of socialist leanings. But the Pullman Porters was the catalyst, am I saying it was the right word, the catalyst of his career as an activist because when uh, the Pullman Porters were organized, I believe uh, unionized, then um, it was a snowball effect for the rest of the country to uh, progress into uh, a jobs for all system. Because as Heron said, it was about jobs. And who gets the jobs? It was before affirmative action. And, and in the early 1900s, the, the best job for an African American was a porter or a barber. That was the best job. But it was the most common job for an African American. Uh, so that was that was A. Phil Randolph. Now, this is this is our African American member, of the SPUSA. Again, the, <laughs> there were a couple of times. There were a couple of times. Madam C.J. Walker was one. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the makeup lady. But it was hair. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Where, where A. Philip Randolph was a prominent African-American labor leader, socialist, and civil rights pioneer, we have another American who was, uh, who was a member of the SPA. That was by the name of Helen Keller. Oh, uh, right. she, Helen Keller was a Socialist Party member. She was a wobbly, and she was a strong advocate for <laughs> individuals with disabilities. This is a book that really brought a tear to my eye because it's, it's titled Helen Keller, Public Speaker, Sightless But Seen, Deaf But Hurt. Right. That is, and this is Helen Keller's speeches. You're welcome. Oh, wow, to look at speeches. That. This is Helen Keller's speeches. Oh, that's a book, yeah. Helen Keller, like like Randolph, was was a pioneer of the civil rights movement, which eventually gave us Brown uh, v. versus the Board of Education, which uh, which influenced my life big time because I'm a product of the magnet school system. Magnet school system came out of Brown v. versus the Board of Education as an alternative to segregated schools, and that's I, I've been in magnet schools all my life, so I'm proud to be a product to the civil rights era. Although I wasn't in the mud, I was uh, a recipient. Which which is which is which is which is yeah, which is which is noble and honorable. And and I got in, in my opinion I never went to private school a day in my life. I got the best education I could ever get. And I went on to SUNY and I got my college, college degree as a disabled American who was supposed to dig ditches. Which is what I would have done in the 1820s, but then again, I would have been a Marxist. Leader. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so when we say Helen Keller as a Socialist Party member, um, it was her and Norman Thomas who pioneered, not Ronald Reagan, who pioneered trade and peace with the Soviet Union. By that time, Helen Keller 
because because the Soviets were considered an evil empire in the 1980s, and and, and the Reagan's term. That was yeah, that was Reagan's term, and it really brought the threat level for nuclear annihilation to, to count down to zero. Anybody who says Reagan made peace with the Russians and, and he and he was and him and Gorbachev were best friends, maybe, but it's bullshit and it's it's incorrect. It's incorrect history. Um, oh, God, this, here you go. This is how kind of spooky. Oh, here you go. Oh, no, no, I just want to tell you, I lived through the fifties. Yeah. I was a kid in um, elementary school. I think I graduated high school in '57. Yeah. And uh, boy. Everybody was scared of the bomb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was mu MAD, mutually assured destruction. You know, yes. and uh, we were taught to hide under, you know, the chairs. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like that was going to help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And somebody came to our school once and showed us if they bombed Manhattan, how we would be affected. Because I lived in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We were quite indoctrinated with be afraid of. Uh, Soviet Union bombing us. You well, know. The, the point I'm trying to make is when, when, when Norman Thomas advocated for trade with, and peace with the Soviet Union, oh, was this was in 1932. He was very radical. He was very radical. He advocated for trade and peace with the Soviet Union. This was in 1932. The bomb hadn't came into fruition until like the 1950s when the Cold War era came. Oh, hate it. And hate it. Helen Keller, in her writings, talked about a, a, a camaraderie with the Soviets and a mutual peace which was uh, non-binding, where Reagan was the one who, uh, again, Fox News is gonna, well, Fox News does, number one, they call Helen. The reason why Helen Keller was such a uh, radical was because we have good writers who will talk about her radical activity as a wobbly and a socialist, because when it comes to Hollywood, Helen Keller, you don't hear about, oh, no. After the miracle, right, right. So there's, you don't hear about that. Yeah. And, this, and, and I'm proud to say that when she spoke, as, as, as we see this, these are her, her writings or her speeches. Um, the reason why she spoke so passionately was because she said, and this at rallies, and a quote: "If my parents weren't wealthy, I would have wound up in a state asylum." That's right. That's right. So that's why she was so passionate as a socialist for social reform. And uh, disabilities, uh, dis uh, advocating for individuals with disabilities, specifically the deaf, the blind, and um, the mute. Learning disabilities didn't weren't really known about back then. You were just called a dunce and put in the back of the classroom. Where or worse, Helen Keller. Yeah, or worse. You were called a dunce and put in the back of the classroom. Where Helen Keller advocated for individuals with disabilities because she was able to uh, come to prominence through her public speaking ability. Now, she was deaf and blind at the same time. Helen Keller. Did she actually speak? A little bit. She had somebody speaking for her? Yeah, I like believe this. the translation was she like, cause, sign and yeah, exactly. Now, she had a translator because it was, it's very difficult for somebody who's deaf and blind to, to speak at the same time. You can't really make out what they're saying. That's Helen Keller's speeches. Um, she would, she, would, she would do her speeches through the power of an interpreter, where when you're doing a, a deaf-blind sign, I believe it's called, you're, you're signing in the hands of the interpreter. Yeah, you're, inter uh, you're signing in the hands of the, that's how Helen, Helen Keller and, and, and Annie Sullivan, or Miss Sullivan, uh, pioneered that. Um, and now when you watch uh, documentaries on people who, now how many people do we know that are deaf and blind at the same time? I mean, can you imagine living in that atmosphere? You, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to maneuver. But Helen Keller was brave and, and, she, and she got over her disability through the power of an interpreter. And it's sad that we only hear about Helen's experience in the movie The Miracle World. Now how many renditions of The Miracle World did they do? They did, I mean, the, the, the girl from Little House on the Prairie played Helen Keller, Patty Duke played Helen Keller. And, that's all you hear about, and you look at Helen Keller, and you think of a person who's unintelligent, suffers from a disability, and who talks funny because she's deaf and blind. 
Well, after the fact, that's when she became a powerful public speaker and she was radical in her politics. So that's not convenient for Hollywood. You got to know. Have to know. So, it's, it pisses me off that you don't hear about Helen Keller's radical activities. You only hear about her uh, experiences with the mayor war, hence the movie. Go ahead. You never hear about the history of the labor movement? No, you don't. I mean, no. you never, uh, Eugene Debs was in jail. Helen Keller was, she was like Debs. Helen jail Keller jail was a wobbly. Helen yeah, Keller was, I, she was a wobbly like Debs. And when Debs ran for jail, you hardly even hear about the fact that a well, ran for president in jail. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He got a lot of votes. Got 900,000 votes. Wow. While in jail, that's <laughs> Debs. Got 900,000 <laughs> votes. Well, that's almost a million. Um, when, when he was in jail, and um, you really wonder, what is the corporate media smoking? Yeah. Because, I, again, I take offense to the fact that if you read the socialist handbooks from 1932, and you read the platform of the SPA, which is the party of A. Philip Randolph, Helen Keller, and Jack London, um, they, again, they talk about peace with the Soviet Union, they talk about um, a limited work day. Mm -hmm. They talk about unionization. They talk about national health care insurance. They talk about this. But Ronald Reagan was the one that made peace with the Soviet yeah. Union. Right. Elect Norman Thomas in 1932, and he probably would have done a better job than Ronald Reagan ever had. So that's that was Helen Keller, and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's sad that Helen Keller. You don't hear about her according to Hollywood, uh, until you don't hear about a radical activity. However, now we go to a general, has anybody got another question about Helen Keller? No, I just I have to agree. I heard about that her being a socialist way after I heard about her. As the miracle. miracle. <laughs> or not as the miracle, yeah, but right. being so schooled by the miracle. Was, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a reason for that. They just carefully ignored the rest of her life. She yeah. became a famous speaker. That was it. You thought, well, she was always a speaking about that. A definite wide speaker then. But I mean, they, they, that's about all you heard. They, you just assumed that she was talking about disabilities. Yeah. You know, you never... Do you leave it well, like I said, I have to leave at oh, 6.30 because, yeah. you know, my wife has to go to work. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Parent, I hope I hit the nail on the head. I'm sorry my, 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 my noodle didn't, didn't get the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, facts uh, entirely correct, but I appreciate you giving me this opportunity here. Oh, no, so to was, was Du Bois a socialist? No, he was communist. <laughs> Oh, he was a communist. Du Bois. Okay. Now, now, Du Bois, yeah. who was who, who was a pine, who, who was a founding member of uh, of the NAACP, which was which was the successor to the Niagara Movement. Uh, du Bois, I believe, at the uh, towards the end of his life, was so fed up with the system <laughs> that he said, "Well, I'm, I'm I'm a communist. I'm now a member of the Communist Party, and uh, I believe Du Bois was a member of the CPUSA, which a lot of African Americans were." Yeah. Again, the the SP and the unions were not as nice to the African American community, which had a lot, which had a real stake in history. Remember, there was lynchings, which W. E. B. Du Bois said, "I'm going to go international, and I'm going to uh, talk about these lynchings and, and wash the." Uh, I believe I, I don't don't get me wrong. This this is a quote. It's not the exact quote. So don't quote me on this. Uh, I believe he, he was he was he washes the uh, the dirty laundry of the of, of the American society wherever he could find soap and water, which his his dirty laundry was lynchings, and which which were notorious in the 1920s. I believe it was the 1920s. The, the 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 amount of African Americans were that were lynched I mean, was, up the, was up into the thousands. Especially the talking peak, a little over a century. Ago. The second yeah. peak of Lincoln lynching was in the uh, late uh, teens, early twenties. Oh, yeah. um, uh, there was a peak in the first decade of um, of the century. Um, there was another peak yeah. when the KKK was formed in the eighteen seventies, and the third peak was in the. Uh, Late After uh, Birth of a Nation in 1915, there was another upswing of, yeah. uh, of lynching. I, I believe the peak of popularity for One the thing I, I want to say before I leave, though, is I, I don't think um, Du Bois actually, I, my, I, I could be wrong about this, that's not the part of Du Bois' corpus that I focus on. Um, 
But uh, I think Du Bois was not actually a communist at first. No, not He was sympathetic to communism and to socialism in general. Yeah. He got persecuted so badly yeah. for his interest and his support of some of the aspects of socialism mm -hmm. that he joined the Communist Party before he left the country. Okay, okay, okay. So, that, he ran for senator of New York. Yes. And, uh, and then, you know, shortly after, he, he joined the Communist Party and then he left. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. went to Ghana. Well, when Du Bois ran for senator, to the SP's credit, um, the SP, and you actually see this when you go to the, the uh, House of Representatives website, uh, the SP can boast uh, two House members, Victor Berger, and the other one was uh, Victor Berger and... Um, they'll come back to me. Victor Berger was, one, was a member of the House of Representatives. Now, we don't understand this today because the, there were so many divisions in the socialist uh, movement that you think of a, uh, of a socialist being elected to Congress as an SP member. Victor Berger was, 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 was it. He was, he was a congressman, and then there was another congressman, and the name's going to come back to me, but this was in 1912 when Victor Berger was elected to uh, the House of Representatives. Now we have a socialist, uh, a democratic socialist uh, uh, United States Senator. His name is Bernie Sanders. Yep. He is the only socialist on Capitol Hill, and he's not even registered as a socialist. He's an independent. Yeah, but identifies as a socialist. But he's yeah. philosophical. He's, he's yeah. a democratic. Heron, I love you. Okay. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you have this. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Huh? Oh, no, no. I actually had flyers. Okay. I forgot. All right, everybody. Take care. Love you, Harry. Okay, too. What's up? And you got a copy of the timeline? Yeah. Did you get a copy of the timeline? Thank you. I got to leave okay. momentarily okay. 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 but I had some questions for you. Good, yeah, any questions? Um, socialism is something we've been talking about at work. Yeah. Oh, really? When the boss is not around. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's something you sort of say quietly. Where does the Socialist Party stand now in the United States and say locally? Well, there's three organizations which claim heritage to the party of Eugene Debs and Armand Thomas. Um, it's uh, FPUSA, Socialist Party USA, um, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, and my group, the Social Democrats USA. All of them, when they were united before 1972, were um, under the banner of the SPA, the Socialist Party of America, the Party of Debs and Armand Thomas. Your question is where they stand and what? Where do they stand in the country today? I mean, as far as how active are they, how many members do they have? Well, their, their youth caucus, the International Union of Socialist Youth, which is an international uh, youth caucus, is the largest socialist youth organization in the world. I believe there's a couple thousand members. Uh, their popularity, the peak in popularity of the Socialist Party uh, was in 1912 when Eugene Debs received, uh, I think, six percent of the popular vote. Uh, that there was 900,000 votes. There was 6% of the popular vote. Now that's amazing compared to what Ralph Nader got in 2000, which was barely 2.5. So that was the peak in popularity in the Socialist Party of, for the Socialist Party of America was in 1912 when Debs ran against uh, uh, Eugene Debs ran against uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, William Howard Taft, and uh, Woodward. After that, it started declining, and the numbers dwindled in the 1950s to about 20,000 votes, which now, is nothing. You're with the Democratic Social I'm with the Social Democrats. Social Democrats. I used to be a DSA member and I used to be an SPUSA member. So I was a member of all three organizations. I think they should all unite, but there's a little bit of ideological differences. That's why I believe they shot themselves in the foot when they split apart over ideological differences dealing with uh, communism mostly. Yeah. So it is or isn't synonymous with communism. No, it's not. Not democratic socialism. There's, there's